And now it is my pleasure to introduce our final keynote. Shein has been making a lot of noise in the market, everything from its disruptive business model to its rapid growth and, of course, the upcoming IPO. Um, the company has taken the fashion world by storm, and it doesn't show any sign of slowing down. So it is with great pleasure that I have a chance to introduce Peter Pernod Day. He's the head of strategic communications US and UK for Shein. And he is being interviewed by Oliver Chen, who's the retail luxury um, new platform sector head at Cohen. Please join me in welcoming Peter and Oliver to the Commerce Next Stage. Peter, it's great being here with you and thanks for joining us. So for starters, how many people here, raise your hand if you've shopped at Shein. And raise your hand if you think this is cute. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a necessary, unnecessary item from Shein, but beautiful home object too. And you, you got this at our December pop-up store in Times Square. We were highlighting some of our expanded category offerings in home goods, so I'm glad you kept it. It looks like it's in great shape. So Peter, arguably, um, this is the most important presentation of the whole conference, uh, as Shein's been really a revolutionary force in driving a, a new kind of business model as well as experiencing remarkable growth globally. Um, so for starters, um, what are your core competencies? Uh, what do you believe sets the company apart? So I, I think at, at bottom, our, our truly innovative approach is that we've been able to connect designers and customers together in a new and very interesting way that has both freed us from seasonality, but also allowed us to be very reactive to changing customer tastes. And that's proven to be very, very effective at reaching Gen Z customers. And the reason we're able to do that is our unique business model. And so in order to make it a little bit clearer about what that means and how we make clothes, we've prepared a little video for you. So if you guys could roll the tape, you can show the audience uh, how we make stuff. One of the biggest questions we get here at Shein is how our prices are so affordable. The answer is actually pretty simple. We begin the design process with you, the customer. When Shein drops a new style, we start with a small batch order of only 100 to 200 units. Because Shein doesn't have physical stores, there's no need to produce thousands of units at a time. Then we use innovative technology to track which items are trending in real time and quickly stock more to meet your demands. With this unique approach, Shein aims for variety over volume, offering more of the items you love and less of the ones you don't. We've cut inventory waste to a fraction compared to traditional retail stores. And the best part is that we pass those savings directly to you. At Shein, we're proud to be your fashion destination for on-trend styles, and our business model makes it possible. To learn more, visit sheingroup.com. Peter, that highlights a speed and breadth, which are key principles of your model. And the future of retail is about matching supply and demand. Tell us about speed and breadth at Shein and why it matters and how it powers all the success you've had. One of the, the best ways I've come up with to an analogize our business is to a A-B test, where we're able to put in front of customers a very wide array of options and then allow them to select what they resonate with from that optionality. And this has had two principal benefits. One, it's allowed us to be in almost constant conversation with our customers. But two, it's allowed us to penetrate markets as diverse as Saudi Arabia and Brazil, and to really be able to see tremendous growth in those markets while profitably making clothes that I think you know, others may have overlooked in looking at more core, more competitive markets. And so I think that's something that has really set us apart and been able to drive growth. I think the other thing that it's instilled in us is at the heart of our business model is a willingness to fail. Only about 50% of our designs will ever go on to have a second run. And even that second run may be as small as 300 additional units. And so at the real heart of our business is this agility, this openness to change and adaptability that I think has allowed us to pivot multiple times through the history of the business to address either compliance risks, new market risks, or to adapt fully new technologies as they come online. So 
I think that agility and that commitment to agility is something that really sets us apart. Well, you just mentioned um, pivoting and, and that answer. What are some highlights of pivots you've made that would be interesting to share with people here? So I think one of the pivots that we've made in the last several months is adapting a marketplace model. And what we've tried to do is be a fashion first business where we have our own clothing brands, our own beauty and lifestyle brands. But then we've noticed that there is additional demand amongst our customers for other product categories that we're not as strong in, a classic example being menswear. And so we've been looking for brand partners and seller partners to come onto a platform to meet these category gaps that we've observed in our market. And that's something that we were able to do in a little under a year in the United States. And it shows that both the agility and flexibility of our business in changing a very fundamental component of how we conduct that business in a relatively short time. Uh, so all, one of the philosophies we think about is stakeholders and profits with purpose, and how do you define purpose? Will customers pay for sustainability? What does sustainability really mean? Um, you've been with me on campus at Columbia and Wharton, where I teach a class at Columbia as well. And the hot topic for students is sustainability and incoming questions on your key strategies here. Where are you? What would you highlight as your strengths as well as opportunities? So I think, first of all, it's important to acknowledge that there is an enormous opportunity in the sustainable fashion space. And it's one that I think is going to challenge the entire industry, us included, to make some radical changes in how we conceive of our supply chains, how we conceive of our products. I think at one point, Oliver, it was OK to say we made a garment and we sold it and we're done with it. I think now we see that we have to take responsibility for the raw materials that are used to make that garment. We have to take responsibility for the manufacturing process and the ethics of that manufacturing process. And then we have to take accountability for what happens at the end of the life of those garments. We're working on all three. From the input point, we've been experimenting with new fabrics, new fibers, new materials, particularly around dead stock material through our partnership with Queen of Raw to try to lessen the impact of the materials we use. Work still needs to be done, but we've made some significant progress. I think on the manufacturing itself, our commitment to supply chain visibility and to rooting out forced and child labor are real and profound and have been a significant investment of the company for at least the last 10 years. And I think that's an area where we think it's important for the entire industry to work together to drive real change in the way that clothes are made around the world. In addition, our on-demand model itself and its waste reduction capabilities, I think could serve as a template for a way to have a less impactful form of production over time. Work still needs to be done for us and our emissions remain relatively high, but there is work going on today to help lower those emissions and to use the on-demand model to reduce waste. And I think finally, there's the end of life of garments. We've been partnering with our partners at Forever 21 and Happy Returns to allow for take backs at stores. We've launched a retail exchange in the United States where Shein customers can sell used clothes to other customers. And we've launched an EPR fund where we are committed to responsibility for the end of life of garments and the impacts that those garments have when they enter landfill or waste. I think much more needs to be done on all three categories, but we see it as a strategic opportunity for the brand to really grow and use our technologies to try to create solutions for the future of the industry. On this topic of sustainability and the multifaceted opportunities you articulate, which ones will be harder and what should the room know about strategies that different companies can take to partner or make advancements here? So I think the hardest one um, is at the beginning of the process and the second hardest one is at the end of the process. Let me explain why. I, I think there is a capital gap. There is not enough investment in next generation fibers, next generation materials. And I think we need collectively as an industry, all of us in this room who are working in retail garment production to continue to push for large quantity mass produced next generation materials that are lower impact. I think the failure of Renew Cell, and although it has recently been saved, I think that points to a gap in the market that we can all work together to fill. I think at the end of life, there's also a need to understand how we can increase garment recycling capabilities. You know, right now it's relatively easy to recycle a plastic bottle. 
We'd like to see that be capable for garments, where customers can take a used garment, toss it in the bin, it's recycled and given a second life. I think that's ultimately where we need to get to. But just like that first one, it's gonna take what we call collective action, all of us working together, governments working together to make that a reality. Yeah, at TD Cowan, a big topic for us is also um, thinking about water and water pollution and fibers and dyeing. That will require collaborative effort in our view. Yeah. Um, so the, the hottest topic and maybe the most important topic in all of retail and a lot of the success we see at a lot of players has to do with speed and agility and route to market and really marrying this logic of a fast responsive supply chain to the magic of great product like this and other stuff that you sell. <laughs> what about speed? Um, other retailers that I work with need nine months to a year. Um, how have you been able to accomplish matching the supply and demand? So we have a unique system. I, I think it's often misunderstood as like an AI-based system, but what we do is we have in-house designers, typically about 200 to 250 per product category. Those designers contribute designs into a digitized merchant management system, which fully integrates tier one through tier three suppliers. And so instead of having to orchestrate multiple contracts, this system seamlessly assigns materials, uh, inputs, different types of fabrics to that cut measure trim supplier who can then quickly produce the garment. At the same time, that cut measure and trim producer is also given real time insight into how their product is faring on the market. And so they can anticipate additional follow on orders. The effect of this efficiency gain is that we can produce, we can take a piece of clothing from design to for sale in the site in as little as 10 days. And that speed allows us to have this wide optionality that I think customers really like, but also allows us to avoid trends or getting trapped in trends with excess inventory once that trend cycle has ended. Peter, competition is also heating up. Uh, players such as Timu, what do you see happening in the industry? How are you positioned to compete? And how do you think about marketing and brand building and awareness? You know, it's a really interesting time, I think, to be a retailer. I think there's so much disruption that's going on in the industry, and there's so many new and competitive business models that are emerging. I think, you know, price is one, the speed of delivery is another, interesting models with um, AI technology, and then also real advancements in physical retail experience, I think have created a really dynamic moment in the industry, and we're all feeling those effects. I think one of the things that I like about working at Xi'an is that our entire team is really focused on this agile approach, this flexible approach to try and see what works. And I think that gives us a competitive place in the market. And so we're gonna to continue to be inspired by competitors. We're gonna to continue to respond to competition. But I think ultimately what sets us apart as a business is how customer led we are. That on-demand model, that ability to connect designers to customers, I think that's gonna give us an edge in the long term. A retailer uh, many of us grew up loving as well as Forever 21. Um, so what about Shein and physical meets digital? You know, our thesis at TD Cowan is bricks and clicks and the importance of human experiences as well. We've been experimenting for a while, as you know, with, with pop-up shops. And we've seen a, a good bit of success with these pop-up shops. They're activations where we will be in a city for, you know, five days. And what I like to call the ephemeral nature of this, it builds customer excitement, it builds customer engagement, and it satisfies, I think, a need in the market for touch and feel of clothes and an experience with the brand and its iconography. That's been very successful. I'll give you an example. We did one in Hamburg last month in Germany. We had 25,000 visitors in four days at the facility. And that activation, I think, is something we're gonna continue to experiment with. Forever 21, though, is something that poses an even bigger canvas for us. And I think both of the teams at Forever 21 and the team at Xi'an are working together to understand how we can bring customers of Forever 21 to Xi'an and Xi'an customers to Forever 21. One of the ways that's been successful early on is through returns. So we have an integrated return model now where a Xi'an clothing can be returned at Forever 21 stores thanks to our partnership with Happy Returns. And that's been amazing at driving traffic 
for Forever 21 stores. And through the use of discount and QR code coupons, it's also been very helpful at driving traffic to our websites and mobile apps. So we see that as a kind of virtual, or excuse me, virtuous partnership that could hold the future for this kind of bricks and clicks model where a company that does bricks real well and a company that does clicks real well can work together to share a mutual customer base. I also think it's noteworthy um, how global you are and how many markets uh, you participate in. Could you speak to your global footprint and learnings that you've had in these different markets? Not many retailers uh, can really have this kind of success in so many kinds of markets. We serve customers in over 150 countries today. Um, our largest markets are the US, which is about 30% of our business, and the broader European Union, which is about 29% of our business. But we've seen very, very strong growth in the last year and a half in Brazil. We've seen extremely high growth in the Saudi Arabian uh, market. And our, our response to this has been to further localize operations. So I actually have a slide with a map of um, the US. If you could tee up that slide with the map. There it is. So, you know, we have invested heavily in trying to meet the needs of American customers. And we're doing this in Europe, we're doing this in LATAM as well. And the idea is to build out local teams, local logistics capabilities, local technical capabilities to meet the divergent needs of our core markets. And so we have today almost um, 1,500 American employees spread across this footprint. And this has allowed us to continue to serve the US market and to continue to see growth in that market. And I think that's our key lesson from being a global brand is if you're gonna compete somewhere, you really have to have boots on the ground. You really have to have a local understanding of what's needed to succeed in that market. And the US has been the template for that as we've expanded overseas. Another relevant topic is Generation Z. And you've done a great job embracing this younger customer and captivating the younger customer. Can you talk about some of the innovative ways you tap into this and as you think about Generation Alpha as well? I think that uh, Gen Z is in, in many ways a, a democratizing force. I think Gen Z is bold. I think they know what they want. I think they communicate what they want. And they also are not afraid to be themselves. And that empowerment, that democratizing impulse, I think is something that mar marries very well with our on-demand model. The idea that, that customers can find clothes that allow them to self-express, that they can be constantly in conversation with the designer and not be locked into seasonal cycles or designer-led visions, all of those things, I think, contribute to our success and are part of Gen Z. I think it's a little early days for Gen Alpha. You know, I, I have Gen Alpha kids, and I struggle to understand them at times myself. So. I do think that uh, it'll be interesting to see how they contribute to the conversation. But for us as a business, Gen Z has really been our core customer base, and I think it will continue to be that as they age up, and we'd like to age up with them. For those in the room, um, what's your biggest advice for retailers trying to scale or um, technology providers wanting to work with Shein? So I think for, for retailers that are trying to scale, um, I have a bit of, a, of an odd view, but, but my view is it really starts with investing in your team. One of the reasons that we have been so successful as a brand is that we have extraordinary team members. There are 16,000 Shanners around the world who are working every day to try to make sure that our customers remain the center of our business. And that's a real testament to investing in your people. There's a, there's a lot of things you could talk about digital transformation. There's a lot of things you can talk about process optimization. But at the end of the day, these are human systems, and they need investment in human potential. And that's what we've been trying to do as a company. I think in terms of re uh, technologists and technology platforms that work with us, one of the challenges that we see over and over again is that every single retail business is unique. It has a unique story. It has a unique vision. It has a unique value proposition. What that means from a technical perspective is that solutions have to be customizable, they have to be flexible, maybe open architecture, in order to be successful with any brand, and particularly a brand as large and unique as we are. And so when we work with service providers, we're always looking for that technical flexibility, that ability to adapt, that ability to customize or tailor the offering. Black box solutions where you plug in a number and get something out at the end of the day, those don't tend to be as successful for us as a company. 
Last question, um, what are your toughest challenges ahead? And what do you think is most misunderstood about Shein? So I think that the two are actually interconnected. Yeah. Our, our biggest challenge is that we're misunderstood. <laughs> I think people see us and they associate with us a, a set of extraordinary claims, a set of, of values that we just don't share. You know, our commitment is to eradicating things like forced labor. Our commitment is to using technology to deliver clothes in a way that's less impactful and, and more accountable and responsible. All of those things I think get missed in some of the conversations about our company. And so overcoming that and overcoming the cognitive biases that come with that, um, that is a major challenge for us and one that we're actively working to correct at the moment. So Peter, it was a pleasure to be here with you. Um, some key themes that came up, in, in my opinion, from this are one, differentiation through rethinking the supply chain in terms of testing, reading, and reacting to um, your noteworthy global scale and how that's also local too and how you're delivering better service by thinking about local as well. Three, how hard sustainability can be and real opportunities as we think about fabric as well as post-purchase and the need to collaborate across the industry. So it was fun to be here with you. Thank you. Oliver, it's always good to see you. Thank, thank you, you so everybody. much. And thank you all for, for having us and sticking around.